Hello, and welcome to Optimizing the Use of PARP Inhibitors in Ovarian Cancer. This continuing education activity is provided by the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine and educational partner, Vindico Medical Education, and is supported by a grant from GlaxoSmithKline. I'm the chair, Dr. Neetha Lee. I'm an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology in the section of GYN oncology and assistant director for the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center Community Outreach and Engagement at U of C. I am joined today by friends and colleagues. First, Dr. Kathleen Moore, who is the Virginia Curley Cade Endowed Chair in Cancer Developmental Therapeutics and a professor in the section of GYN Oncology and the director of the GYN Oncology Fellowship in the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Also joined today is Dr. Barbara Norquist, who is an associate professor in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. Thank you both for being here and for preparing for this. I'm actually so excited to learn so much from both of you as experts in this area. The inclusion of PARP inhibitors has greatly expanded maintenance therapy options for patients with ovarian cancer. And although these agents have been available for a few years, the various trials for therapy and both frontline and maintenance for those in the setting of recurrence can still be confusing. In thinking through selection, patient counseling, and management of PARP inhibitors as more long-term care chemotherapy options, we wanted to focus on the data that can help with both decision-making about the therapy and in the optimization of PARP inhibitors in appropriate patients. Our objectives of this program are to understand the mechanisms of PARP inhibition, summarize the latest recommendations for testing for BRCA1-2 germline testing, and homologous recombination status in patients with ovarian cancer, differentiate established and emerging PARP inhibitors based on trial data, indications, dosing, and toxicity profile, and apply the latest clinical evidence regarding PARP inhibitors to the individualization of treatment for patients with ovarian cancer. When we think about the practical guidelines that we hope to instill today, it's really thinking about the optimal use, and this includes offering our patients the best evidence-based recommendations, understanding the maze of testing op options for HR, understanding dosing and managing toxicities, and preparing for discussions with patients and caregivers with a shared decision-making model for considering maintenance therapy options that can be very unique and specialized to each patient's situation. We also want to remain up to date as newer data emerges and indications change for maintenance options in frontline or recurrent cancer setting. So I will go ahead and turn this to Dr. Norquist, who will start us off with her um, talk on PARP inhibition, and well as highlighting some key background and mechanism of action studies. Thank you, Dr. Norquist. Thank you, Dr. Lee, so much. I'm really happy to be here um, to talk about uh, these topics. I'm going to start with kind of a basic overview um, of understanding the role of PARP inhibitors. So kind of looking at our upfront treatment of ovarian cancer, how, how do we approach these patients? Uh, so initially we decide if they're a candidate for upfront surgery or not. Um, if they are, they go to surgery and then have adjuvant chemotherapy, typically with a platinum and a taxane. If um, they are not a good candidate for upfront surgery, they'll typically have a biopsy, uh, chemotherapy, surgery, and then additional chemotherapy. And at this point, most of our patients um, enter into a remission. Uh, however, we know that recurrence in ovarian cancer is near ubiquitous, and we're really trying to lengthen the amount of time um, prior to them having to resume a therapy. So historically, at this point, we would just observe the patient and follow them for evidence of recurrence. Uh, but today we're going to talk about uh, different strategies for what is called maintenance therapy uh, in this setting, and then also in the setting of treatment after a recurrence. So what are our main kind of FDA approved options at this point for maintenance after primary treatment of ovarian cancer? One option is always observation. And these decisions are um, highly individualized to the patient and what their goals are uh, for treatment. Uh, so one option is to do nothing. You can do a PARP inhibitor. You can do bevacizumab, or you can do a combination of the two. So how do we decide uh, which of these options to go with. So really for me, this first uh, decision point, the first fork in the road is genetic testing. 
And by uh, genetic testing, I mean testing of both the patient and the tumor, uh, because we can get different information um, from both of these tests. And the National Comprehensive um, Cancer Network guidelines or NCCN, um, ASCO guidelines, and um, other societies as well, recommend that every patient with an epithelial ovarian cancer have testing for inherited mutations that could lead to ovarian cancer and also um, testing of the tumor to help guide therapy. Kind of first fork in the road, is there a BRCA1 or 2 mutation either inherited or present in the tumor? Uh, if you look at the pie chart on the left, um, if you do germline testing, which is testing for inherited mutations, about 15% of patients with ovarian cancer will have an inherited mutation in BRCA1 or 2. And this is one of the highest mutation frequencies of any of the solid tumors. And then an additional 5% um, will have mutations in genes other than BRCA1 and 2 that can lead to uh, both a risk of ovarian cancer as well as influence uh, the treatment. And a certain proportion, somewhere around 8%, will also have a BRCA mutation that's acquired within the tumor. And so the, the different ways of testing for this, the germline testing, you can use a blood sample, a cheek swab, or sometimes patients will spit into a tube uh, for uh, saliva testing. And those mutations are present. Um, but that mutation, if it's found, it's present in every cell in the body because it's inherited from a parent. When we uh, test the tumor, if it's in every cell in your body, it's going to be in your tumor too. So if you have a BRCA mutation um, that's inherited, you will find it in the tumor here most of the time. And if there's an acquired mutation, you will find it on the biopsy. Determining the inherited risk is also incredibly important uh, because the proportion is so high there's uh, substantial opportunities here to prevent cancer in this patient's family. Each of their first degree relatives will have a 50% chance of also inheriting that same mutation that led to the ovarian cancer. And there are high risks of both breast and ovarian cancer in those patients. Uh, we have incredibly effective prevention strategies uh, that they can employ. Uh, and so this is a, the population of patients with ovarian cancer is a really important uh, starting point for identifying um, inherited risk in families. We know that despite these guidelines, a lot of patients are not getting this testing. Uh, it can vary a lot by institution, part of the country, a variety of factors, but it's sort of estimated that maybe around 30% of patients with ovarian cancer are actually completing this testing. And so we need to do better here. So another decision point is whether or not the tumor has homologous recombination deficiency. I feel like that term can be a bit confusing when people are trying to understand like what that means and, and how it's measured. The way I divide this up in my mind is looking at causes and effects of homologous recombination deficiency and which ones you can and can't measure. And a really important cause of homologous recombination deficiency is having one of those inherited or tumor mutations in BRCA1 and 2. Those uh, proteins are critically important to DNA repair, and without them, the uh, tumor cannot adequately repair its, its DNA, and that is a, a cause of homologous recombination deficiency. Inherited and somatic mutations in other genes can also cause that same phenotype, um, epigenetic changes such as methylation, and a variety of other things not listed here can lead to um, a tumor with those characteristics. What uh, tends to be measured in homologous recombination deficiency assays are actually the effects of having had past homologous recombination deficiency. Uh, this uh, feature is sometimes called genomic scarring and it indicates evidence of past homologous recombination deficiency and doesn't necessarily indicate the current status of the tumor. So you can think of it um, kind of as looking for graffiti. You don't know if the person is, is still there um, that made um, this feature. So the um, kind of most frequently used uh, commercial assays are listed here. Most of them are measuring these uh, genomic scars uh, with features such as loss of um, heterozygosity, telomeric allelic imbalance, and uh, large scale state transitions. Uh, these are, again, features that occur genome-wide when there is defective homologous recombination DNA repair.
PARP inhibitors are uh, designed to specifically exploit tumors that have homologous recombination deficiency. And um, the uh, PARP proteins function uh, to facilitate DNA repair in pathways other than the homologous recombination pathway. And so if one mechanism of DNA repair is impaired, and then you impair the rescue mechanisms, that can lead to uh, cell death in the tumor. Now, um, there are actually multiple uh, mechanisms involved uh, with how PARP inhibitors can lead to cell damage and cell death. And this is from a review paper uh, that goes through a multitude of these mechanisms, but the, the chief way that I think of it is it is inhibiting uh, kind of rescue mechanisms of, of DNA repair in tumors that already have this defect um, from either BRCA mutation or other features. This is a just um, short overview of some of the major landmark clinical trials of maintenance therapy in epithelial ovarian cancer. The populations are listed there on the left, uh, BRCA mutated patients or all comers. Uh, the ovarian cancer clinical setting, either upfront maintenance or maintenance after treatment of a recurrence. And then that's just a list of the relevant studies. Also listed here are trials for anti-angiogenesis therapy for maintenance and their uh, corresponding settings. These are some of the FDA approvals that have come uh, from these clinical trials and in these different settings, both in the BRCA mutated population um, the group that also has homologous recombination deficiency, and then uh, the approvals for all comers, um, regardless of BRCA mutation or homologous recombination deficiency. How do you decide what to do in this setting? This is a snippet from the NCCN guidelines for maintenance therapy after upfront treatment of epithelial ovarian cancer. And you can see that it's a convoluted branching diagram with many, many options. Dr. Moore uh, is going to go through the, the clinical trials that help inform uh, what we should do in this setting. So that will be my introduction to pass to her. Thank you so much. This was a really fantastic overview. I had a few questions for us to think about as I'm thinking through um, what you presented, just the critical nature of that, you know, what you described as the first fork in the road and the second fork in the road in terms of getting patients to be able to get the appropriate germline and tumor testing, as well as this consideration for HR um, D testing and through potentially some people are using the commercial assay, some people are using in-house assays, depending on your institution. Can you go over a little bit for me, what your thoughts are in terms of one question I had was like, just the practical tips of like, what's your, what's the workflow that we really need to make sure that we all build in to make sure this is all done in a timely fashion so that when we're ready to kind of get the person to the next thing, you know, maybe just an example of what you guys do or something like that to, to help the audience think through, like, what should we be building as part of our standard of care workflows? I think there's a lot of different strategies that could be employed in this setting. And there are researchers that are studying different methods to try to really like get that number closer to 100% of, of patients having this testing. What we have done at our institution is refer these patients to um, genetic counseling. And then we, the genetic counselor orders a tumor and germline test at this, um, to be run simultaneously um, from the primary tumor using either our in-house assay or commercial assays, depending on um, insurance issues. Uh, we know that we miss some patients with this approach as well. Um, and so there are some groups um, studying things such as uh, mainstream testing, which is just ordering this testing on every patient with ovarian cancer. And then you discuss it if there are positive results or confusing results, um, kind of skipping the whole counseling portion and, um, and some centers where they test um, the tumor first and use that information. My only concern with that approach is we know that we miss some of the inherited mutations. Mm -hmm. And I feel really uh, strongly about identifying all of those. Um, so I'm curious to hear what um, Dr. Moore's group is doing and, and your group too, Dr. Lee. I think what you just described is an ideal circumstance. And I agree with that, you know, if you could do that and replicate that, that would be ideal. Genetic counselors are worth their weight in gold. Uh, and there's just no but to that, other than there's not nearly enough of them 
-hmm. And so the risk of delay um, and loss of testing really, I think, is one of the prohibitive features of, of, of gating testing to genetic counselors. And I know there's some systems that require that. We have great genetic counselors here. I don't have enough of them. And so we are much more mainstream testers. We test everybody the moment we have a diagnosis. We do talk to our patients about what testing means, but I am in no way a genetic counselor and would never pretend to be one. But we do counsel um, because every once in a while, someone opts to not have germline testing done. So we have to respect that. And in those patients, when we do send the tumor testing, so we tend to start with germline. And if that is not find a, a germline mutation, we opt for sending the tumor. Um, we often send the tumor anyway, also because we're just looking for other targetable mutations that may be downstream. And so we tend to do that relatively early, but we have to be careful there because if patients really do not want to know their genetic makeup, you discover that on the somatic testing and True. it's kind of hard to ignore. So that is fortunately rare, but real. And I think you have to be aware of it. So we start with germline and then we send tumor in almost everybody, unless they have a germline and it's really kind of irrelevant to do so unless on a clinical trial later in the recurrent setting, when you're trying to figure out if something has changed. I agree with you know some places in all of Canada, for example, does starts with the tumor. Um, so they get all the tumor sent from all the different provinces. And that's how they started with it to make it cost effective. And then they reflex to genetic counselors if they find something that needs germline testing. Um, and you will miss what we think like 5%, Barbara, of these large, large rearrangements will get picked up with somatic testing. Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's the best estimate I've heard. It's about yeah. not 5% of all patients you're missing a mutation, but 5% of mutation carriers right. are missing. It's important because if you miss them and you never genetically test them, you've missed the opportunity to cascade test their family and prevent these cancers. And that's real. And I also feel strongly about that. I agree with Dr. Norquist. I'm a little more pragmatic at this point though. I would much rather us get to if 100% of the U.S. did tumor testing, at least, so that we could identify patients and then get them reflexed, we would be so far ahead of where we are now. And then that would allow cascade testing to happen way more than it does. And 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 it's kind of, I'm just going to say, it's kind of embarrassing that we're, we have yeah. all these resources here in the U.S. and we are nowhere near that goal. And it's actually been modeled by statisticians at MD Anderson, this has been published that if we did this perfectly and identified all of our germline mutation carriers and then did correct cascade testing with risk reduction in unaffected relatives, we would reduce ovarian cancer incidence by 20% right off the top. Amazing. Like eliminate it. So they never have to be our patients. They can just be people living in the world without ovarian cancer. So it frustrates me that we are so far from that. Um, and, and I will get the last 5% once we get to 95%, then I'll worry about, but, but I would just really like to get us over eight. Sure. Like I'd be yeah. ecstatic about that at this point, which is not a very high bar, but we have not gotten close. No, I completely agree with you. We do the same in terms of we tend to do germline testing, usually through our genetic counselors. Um, the telehealth world has helped us a lot in terms of the genetic counselors being able to reach more patients who had never wanted to come back for a visit um, if they lived far. So that's been really very helpful. But I do agree that there are some patients that will test because they don't you know, aren't, aren't going to go to the genetic counselors, but we tend to do the same thing. Uh, germline testing followed by tumor testing. Although I do think that we've run into a lot of insurances for different versions of like tumor testing. And there's a lot of differences within our population of which insurances will allow us to get which type of tumor testing done. So that's added a whole other administrative um, hurdle, which I think we've really tried to get to, to be able to get all of these answers. So um, I think that those are really practical issues and really such an important where area of thinking about primary prevention and thinking about risk reduction that goes well beyond just um, 
the issue of PARP inhibitors, right? But I think it is the opening to that, which I think is really important. One of the things that, you know, we were talking about a little bit and you mentioned a little bit is sort of this like, you know, kind of this this diversity of what does HR deficiency actually mean and like what are the ways that um, that we can think about um, HR deficiency as well. So I don't know if you want to go into, and I think we may have a, sh- a slide to share, talking really about kind of the complexity of that diagnosis and the and sort of the nuances that may make it a little bit difficult to um, really understand, you know, are we getting all of the patients we need? And as we're learning more, are there going to be more patients who may be appropriate potentially for PARP inhibition um, therapy? Yeah. And I think that's a really super important point um, because we, you know, BRCA mutation, like that's pretty uncontroversial. We know how to test for that. Um, And I don't think any of us would, like, regardless of an HRD result, if a patient has one of those mutations, they would be a candidate for a PARP inhibitor and kind of thought to be in our highest responding group. It's sorting out who else uh, really gets benefit. And the the assays that we have now really do just measure the, the past condition. And so they work as a predictor, but they're not a functional test. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily indicate the the moment to moment status of the tumor and whether or not it will respond um, to these therapies. I agree with that. I 100%. We're probably closer to it being functional by testing in the front line. These were originally developed in the recurrent setting, and sometimes you're testing archival tissue and now you're looking at it to predict benefit to PARP in a setting that's been years later. And so you really are in that setting where it's sort of representative of a fossil or a tattoo, you know, mm-hmm. all these different cute. Um, comparisons, but you don't really know if it represents the state of the tumor at that point. Mm -hmm. When you're testing in the front line, maybe it's a little bit more accurate of that. But I think the other big challenge uh, is that, you know, these tests were developed differently. Well, number one, um, and Dr. Norquist showed you the two FDA approved tests in her talk, which is foundation one and myriad tests. But basically every assay company has some version of loss of heterozygosity or an HRD panel. Um, so the, and we're just not talking about them because they're not FDA approved, not because they're not good or bad. Like we just don't know is the bottom line. And the Myriad test was developed to identify tumors that were BRCA wild type, but looked like BRCA. So that's how that was validated. And the foundation test was validated based on clinical data. And that's how that was validated. But irrespective of that, they're both continuous variables. And we picked a point and said, okay, if you're 42 or greater, you're homologous recombination deficient. And if you're, or 16% or higher. And if you're less than that, you're homologous recombination. We were saying proficient, but you really can't say that because you don't know that that tumor is proficient. You just know that they're test negative. And, And if there's upcoming restrictions, and we'll talk about this later on, the labels for use of HARP inhibitors based on that test, when you have someone who's got a, Myriad tests, let's say a 40. Really? You're not going to, and they responded to their frontline platinum. Really? You're not going to give a PARP to that person because they're 40 and not 42 or 14%, uh, which was the original cut point and not 16%. So we've, you know, it's just like anything. We have a test, there's shouldering and, and you're missing folks. So they're good tests, but they're not perfect. And we just need to keep working on them to really figure out if you can identify women or tumors, I should say, who are not going to benefit at all from a PARP, perfect. Then I'm on board with that. I will not use it. But right now you have not shown me a test that that shows me that. So it's very, it's a little area of clinical equipoise in my mm-hmm. in my book. With that, I think we'll go on to hear from Dr. Moore. Um, um, thank you so much for um, really reviewing some of the really key trials and thinking through our um, uh, how we're going to think about our our treatment strategies. So I'm going to just sort of take us through really what has been an evolving treatment paradigm in ovarian cancer, and I always like to level set. Um, cause I think that sometimes when we have listeners, they, you know, maybe very high volume, um, caregivers for those with ovarian cancer and others are not quite as, you know, high volume, um, providers. And so I just want to level set with sort of what we get with paclitaxel carboplatin alone, because, you know, what we talk about with at least high grade serous and high grade endometrioid ovarian cancer is that uh, unfortunately we don't have good screening. And so they largely um, present at advanced stage, bad part, 
good part is that they tend to be exquisitely chemosensitive to um, platinum-based therapy in the front line. And so there's this sort of belief that there's this cure rate or you know high and low risk patients. And so I just like to level set a little bit so we understand the foe here. Um, and this is a good representation of that. So this is Icon 8. I'm not really interested in talking too much about Icon 8 other than just to say it is the last study in a modern era. It was presented in 2017 and published the year thereafter that was done with no maintenance therapy, no um, biologic at all, no stratification based on BRCA or homologous recombination deficiency status. It was a purely advanced stage high-grade epithelial ovarian cancer giving paclitax on carboplatin three ways. And you can see from this curve that there wasn't a winner, but the curve is representative of what we have seen for decades for women with advanced ovarian cancer. And so what you can see is that this is a progression-free survival Kaplan-Meier curve. You'll see this shouldering. And this is the 20% of tumors that recur on or within six months of that first chemotherapy. And we term this primary platinum resistance. And this group of tumors, despite a tremendous amount of effort, we have not cracked this nut. Preventing these are high priority, high unmet need, because the prognosis here for these tumors is incredibly poor. So we're working on that, 20%. It's been that way for decades. The other thing to know is that by about three years, two and a half to three years, about 80% of women with advanced stage ovarian cancer, stage three and four, will have recurred. And once recurred, we're no longer curable. Now, we have many things to treat them for many, many years, and that's the good news, but they're no longer curable, and they will spend a large fraction of the remainder of their life on some sort of therapy. And so if we're going to change that, we have to do better, A, with prevention, which we're not talking about today, but we could a little bit, but more with curing more patients uh, in the front line. And so that really came into some focus with the, the addition of maintenance therapy. And so this is a, a timeline of uh, regulatory milestones. So this is when things were approved and for maintenance therapy and advanced ovarian cancer, both in the US and then in the EMA. So bevacizumab presented both in the US and in Europe in 2011, approved in Europe in 2011, not approved until 2018 um, for a lot of reasons in the US, but that was our first maintenance and then it became a PARP world. So we can kind of talk about why that is. But again, let's level set. This isn't new data. Uh, this is old data, but just to see how did that curve change? How did the shape morphology of the progression-free survival curve change from what I showed you with the Icon 8 with the addition of bevacizumab? So what you're seeing on the left is GOG-218, and on the right is Icon 7. These were similar but not identical studies of the incorporation of bevacizumab with and to follow frontline chemotherapy. And the take home here is that we push the progression-free survival curve a little bit to the right. And so you see about a 20 to 30% reduction in the hazard of progression or death with addition of bevacizumab. So I think if you like baseball, this would be a base hit. It's an important medicine, but no impact on overall survival. Uh, and so we weren't curing more patients so that they didn't have to receive subsequent therapy. But we were pushing out the time until they would receive their next line of therapy, which is important. And so you can be glass half empty or half full about bevacizumab, but it does remain an important part of our armamentarium. So then the PARPs came into play. And you heard in the preceding talk why we were interested in PARP inhibitors, given the high prevalence of factors that make tumors predominantly high-grade serous and high-grade endometrioid vulnerable to use of DNA damage repair inhibiting agents like platinum, but also like PARP inhibitors. So what I have here is sort of a summation slide of the um, five randomized phase three studies done with PARP maintenance uh, in the front line. Starting on the Naraparib experience, both in the, in the US and Europe in Prima, and then in China with Prime, only in BRCA-associated cancers here on this slide. So you can see the hazard ratio is 0.45 and 0.4, so about a 60% reduction in the hazard of progression or death with use of naraparib in these settings. You see the olaparib experience, the SOLA1, which is the only study that was done exclusively in BRCA-associated cancers. And so this isn't a subset of a bigger study. This is the whole study uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.33. And then Paola1, this is the BRCA subset, BRCA subset. This was olaparib bevacizumab versus bevacizumab. So an active control, this is the only one with an active control, 
hazard ratio 0.4. And then on the right, you see the recently presented rucaparib data from Athena Mono with a hazard ratio of 0.4. So these are progression-free survival curves. And in general, you can say a 60 to 70% reduction in the hazard of progression or death with use of PARP switch maintenance in a BRCA-associated cancer. And so this alone really established PARP inhibitor, and I don't care which one you use, as the standard of care in this setting. Um, there is no other option to pick from. It is PARP or PARP plus bevacizumab, but as, if you're not using a PARP inhibitor here outside of a patient who elects not to do it, of course, there's shared decision-making, but your choice is PARP alone or with bevacizumab. That is very clear. Now, here's the data in BRCA wild type, but homologous recombination deficient. Um, in the same studies, now you'll notice SOLA1 went away because these patients were not included. And so what you can see with niraparib, you have hazard ratios of 0.66 and 0.58. So about a 34 to 40% reduction in the hazard of progression or death. In Paula, the hazard ratio is 0.43. So about a 57% reduction, again, versus bevacizumab and active control. And then finally, again, rucaparib with a hazard ratio of 0.58. So again, these are statistically and clinically relevant improvements in progression-free survival in these subset analyses. Please note these are subsets, not primary groups. So we have to take them all with a grain of salt. That's why there's not p-values here with the exception of prime because these were subsets, but very consistent across the studies in terms of the magnitude of benefit for use of a PARP in this setting. Now, the group where we really have work to do, in my opinion, and we can discuss this in the panel, is these tumors that are characterized as homologous recombination deficiency test negative. And they've been variously called homologous recombination proficient, which kind of implies we know the behavior or the mechanism to Dr. Norquist's talk earlier. We really don't. We just know the test is negative. So I call them homologous recombination deficiency test negative. Some of these are unknown though, because sometimes the test fails. And so they're all lumped in here as well. And so what you can see here is also, I think, very consistent with the exception of prime, which was done in China. And we really can't explain why these patients did so well, I'm happy for them. But we need to see the manuscript here. Um, it's maybe a pharmacogenomic issue with PARP in a, in a purely Chinese population, but this is a, definitely an outlier. But for US and European studies, Prima, Paula, and Athena, I think what I want you to see is the shape, the morphology of these curves here. Look at how vertical they drop as compared to these, as compared to these. So prognostically, irrespective of how good the assay is, they are identifying a group of tumors that do not do very well following completion of platinum. And so we need to figure out why that is and do better. PARP inhibitors have a role here. Um, it's not as strong, I think we can say, as in the other settings. Here in Prima, it's a hazard ratio of 0.65, so a 35% reduction in the hazard of progression or death. And Athena Mono is very consistent in a very different population. So there is a benefit here. In Paula, there was no benefit over bevacizumab. So the PARP didn't add anything over bevacizumab, which is why the label is what it is, and that even though this was a subset analysis, the use of the combination is not authorized in the US and in most parts of the world, there's a few exceptions to that, for tumors that are homologous recombination test negative or unknown. You can only use it in homologous recombination deficient test positive or BRCA. So this is a group where you do see a benefit of PARP, not as pronounced, and honestly, we need to do better. This is just a kind of summary table. Um, hopefully you'll get a copy of the slides. This is all in the public domain, just outlining the hazard ratios and the medians. Although I would encourage you, I know we always put these comparisons up and say no cross-trial comparisons, then we do it anyway. But here it's really important because the meat, these, these populations were very different. Prima was an incredibly clinically high risk population by design, um, very different than Solo. Paula and Athena are probably a little closer to one another. So comparing the medians is very misleading to you because they're completely different populations. I think the hazard ratios give you a better sense of consistency of the data across the different studies um, and also a more accurate risk reduction estimate of the activity of that agent, PARP versus placebo or bevacizumab in each individual trial. So this just summarizes across the four trials. I didn't put prime in here because it's non-US. And then solo, of course, 
um, only has BRCA. Now we do have updated data from solo to share, which I'm excited about because we did share, this isn't the final OS endpoint because we may never reach it in full disclosure because the patients are doing so well. And so we spent a little bit of alpha um, on a look at OS at uh, seven years, 84 months. And so this was presented by my co-PI, Dr. Paul De Silvestre, just a few weeks ago in Paris at ESMO. And what you can see here is that at seven years, 67% of women randomized to Olaparib versus only 46.5% of those randomized to placebo remain alive from their ovarian cancer. And this is despite a 44% appropriate crossover in the placebo arm to PARP on subsequent lines of therapy. And so the message here is that you can't catch people up by saving PARP for later. I've heard people want to do that because the hazard ratios and the platinum sensitive and the frontline are 0.3. And so they're going to wait until a patient recurs and then use it. You don't catch them up. And so please see that from this and don't do that. Use it in the frontline. And so overall survival is good. We really never show that in much in ovarian cancer, but now we're getting greedy. So it's not just overall survival. It's how many of those patients of those 67% who are alive at seven years never recurred. How many of them are potentially cured? It's 45%. So at, at seven years, we have 45% of patients who are randomized to a leopard who have never recurred from their disease versus a little less than 20% on placebo. So it is true that there are there is a population of women with BRC-associated cancers who, who get platinum surgery and platinum-based therapy, and they're probably cured. It's sitting maybe around 18%. We'll see what happens over time. And so we are over-treating that 18% to help the rest. Um, but we have um, over doubled the number of patients who are disease-free at seven years. And the event rate is so slow now when we get to nine years, which is when we could probably call it, it'll probably be about the same. So I do believe we have cured women um, on this cohort. Now, the flip side of this is 56% of women did recur and 25% recur on PARP and 25% recur after PARP. And so the next, our next big question is, how do we prevent that? You know, why did they recur on a PARP? Why did they recur after PARP? Is there anything I can add to the PARP to prevent that? Um, so we shouldn't be, we should be excited about this, honestly, and celebrate for these women that are likely cured and living their life off all therapy for five years. Um, but we also have to do better for the 56% who have recurred um, and figure out why uh, and how we can fix that. Paula One also gave us OS data Based on their statistical analysis plan, they were going to look at it at the five-year mark, which they reached. So it wasn't based on event maturation. It was just based on a time point. And so what you can see here, and this is nice data to have for the BRCA, not unexpectedly, it does look statistically significantly better for Olapra, Bevacizumab versus Bevacizumab, 73 versus 53% still alive. They did not tell us who was disease-free versus in each group. So I hope to see that in an upcoming um, presentation. HRD positive BRCA wild type, it's 54 versus 44. So there is no detriment here um, to OS. Uh, and these patients are still benefiting despite crossover. And then the HRD test negative, just like PFS, it wasn't any better. So we, we don't expect it to be better in OS. And if anything, the bevacizumab looks a little bit better, but this is a subset analysis. And so all you can say is that there's no superiority here of the two. And we knew that um, this is a group we need to work harder in. So that's sort of the frontline data and where things are. Um, we have had, as many of you know, some reversals of availability of PARP inhibitors uh, uh, due to voluntary withdrawals based on late line studies, um, Quadra, Aerial 4, and Solo 3. None of these studies were designed to look at overall survival. Um, they were not statistically powered to look at overall survival and they have very little alpha attributed to overall survival uh, and lots of missing data and lots of complications. But for whatever reason, um, the FDA is looking at the overall survival and has raised some concerns that led to withdrawal for these treatment indications. So this is treatment in late line ovarian cancer or BRCA associated cancers for third, fourth, fifth line. You should be using PARP in the front line. So it bothers me about this, but it, you should be using it in the front line. And so I don't really think it impacts our patients negatively because they should be getting it in the front line. So I mentioned to you though, even in our best case scenario for ovarian cancer with 44% of patients, I think cured in solo, 56 have recurred. And even more so in non-BRCA. 
So if we're using all our good drugs in the front line, what do we do when they recur? Like, what's your option? Well, your option is really based on what they've received. And so if they've received in the front line um, PARP inhibitor, but they're bevacizumab naive, bevacizumab has an OS advantage. And I'll show you that in a moment. So that's kind of your clear choice. If they receive bevacizumab and they're PARP naive and they respond to their next platinum, key point, you have to respond, then clear your clear choice is a PARP inhibitor. If they've gotten both, then, you know, then it's controversial and we need more drugs and clinical trials and maybe we can reuse PARP. This is the data for um, bevacizumab, but there is a modest improvement in OS with carbodoxal bev versus carbogenbev. That's a European study. And then we do see the same modest improvement with carbotaxel bev versus carbotaxel alone with GOG213. So bevacizumab is an important medication here for our patients. The PARP inhibitor data, uh, this is where all the big phase three studies first uh, resulted. And we first had our first confirmed approvals for PARP inhibitors in the platinum sensitive recurrent setting amongst patients with recurrent disease who got a platinum, responded to that platinum really, really well, and then could get on switch maintenance. So it's a very different patient population than these studies where you went on at the beginning of your platinum. So again, you cannot compare medians here because they totally, the time starts at completely different time points. This is from the beginning of chemo and includes patients who did not, whose tumors that did not respond or maybe were stable or maybe progressed. This requires you responded really, really well and then went on a part. And that's the most important predictor here. That's why the biomarkers didn't matter because you've selected tumors that, that responded really well to their platinum. And by virtue of that, who cares what the assay says? I already know you're vulnerable to DNA damaging agents because you responded to platinum. So of course these are gonna work across the board and they did. But all these studies were done in PARP naive tumors. So it's not super relevant now. And so what do we think about now? Are you sensitive to, is your tumor sensitive to platinum based on that prior length of therapy, prior response or not? What's your mutation or status? What's your molecular status? Are we talking about the primary treatment of the recurrence or maintenance? And did you get a prior PARP? That's become a really key kind of factor. And so just to kind of remind you, um, I think I showed you that table, so I'll blip through this pretty quick. This is the data from SOLO2, PFS and OS, very promising and continues to be for BRCA-associated platinum-sensitive recurrent disease in a PARP maintenance world. These patients will not exist very often much longer because they're going to be getting it in the front line and hopefully cured. Nova was BRCA, germline BRCA, BRCA wild type. Importantly though, this is before we understood the power of somatic BRCA. And so they were included in the BRCA wild type group. Now we know that is a, was probably a mistake, but that's just where they live um, with niraparib. And so here's the germline BRCA and the non-BRCA progression-free survival, very positive leading to approval. Here's the breakdown in HRD, BRCA, BRC wild type, and then HRP. And again, it all looks positive because all these tumors melted away to platinum. And so you, that clinical biomarker was really important. And then here's the OS. And this is another study where NOVA was never designed to look at OS um, at all. And there's a lot of missing data and a lot of instability in these assessments, which is why there's this adjust, adjusted IPCW analysis, because there was so much missing data when this was presented. This did lead to a dear doctor letter because the BRCA wild type HRD looked like it was on the wrong side of one with a confidence interval that crossed one, in my opinion, has been overinterpreted based on the instability of estimates, be that as it may, no one's asked my opinion. But this is the OS data for the BRCA wild type. And then for the BRCA, there does not appear to be any even suggestion of detriment. So we're following this closely, um, but this is a very hot topic amongst many of us right now. And there's many trials planned right now uh, in platinum sensitive because we need new things. We just can't keep reusing stuff. We need new drugs. Unfortunately, this one just read out at ESMO, which was a Tezo bevacizumab versus bevacizumab alone in a platinum sensitive recurrent setting. And just like my study, Imagine 50 in the front line, this one was negative as well. So we're waiting for Anita, which is part plus immunotherapy in the platinum sensitive setting. Hard to put that in context though, when many patients are getting PARP in the front line, but that'll be the next big readout. And then uh, up next and Gloriosa are bringing antibody drug conjugates into this space, which is exciting. So that would be where I would end. I think um, in the front line, 
uh, we should be using part 100% for BRCA. Um, I really think they're indicated for HRD BRCA wild type and for homologous recombination test negative, we just need better drugs um, and better targets and to keep working here to improve outcomes for our patients. But until then, I think PARP or Bevacizumab are very reasonable to offer patients and you should feel great talking to patients about any kind of option here, um, but, but watch out for clinical trials. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic review of so many different trials and in a great organized way. So for us to really think through the progression of what the researchers were thinking in terms of what was up and coming as well. So I think that's really important to think through. When I think about kind of like, what are we thinking through now and what are, you know, what are some of the, the, the options that we're thinking about? I do think that there are a lot of questions that people have because we've moved the PARP inhibitors to the front line. So I was hoping that Barbara, you could talk a little bit about like, well, why don't PARP, like what happens for PARPs to stop working, right? Like what is that group of that, you know, percentage of patients who are not going to respond who though had um, indications, whether it's the HRD testing or germline testing, talk a little bit about some of the molecular mechanisms that may be re related to PARP inhibitor resistance. And then thinking through a little bit of the trials, as you mentioned, about what do we know so far about retreatment with PARP inhibitors and who are really the, maybe the select group that we could think about that with. We know that the later in therapy that we use PARP inhibitors, they have decreased efficacy. Um, and so why is that? I mean, like any other treatment, you can develop resistance uh, to therapies. One of the more kind of interesting mechanisms, at least for me, of developing PARP inhibitor um, resistance is something called a reversion mutation, which is where the, um, the BRCA mutation that might have led to excellent response to therapy can actually get um, kind of secondary mutations can happen within the tumor that can actually restore a functional BRCA protein. And then now the tumor is more proficient at repairing its DNA and it can be resistant to both platinum and PARP inhibition. And we know that we can induce um, those reversion mutations through exposure to both PARP inhibitors and to platinum mm -hmm. uh, chemotherapy. And there's a number of other mechanisms um, that can occur as well. And just the later a person is in therapy, there are more and more mechanisms that can promote resistance. Yeah, really going back to the idea of the importance of pushing PARP, you know, probably up you know, closer towards if it's not, if not frontline for, you know, select patients, as obviously we want to emphasize that for our, our um, BRCA mutated patients as well as HRD. But I do think that that does go to the, the idea of when would PARP become most useful for sure. And also the toxicity profiles with later use are different as well. Mm -hmm. um, we know the rates of MDS and AML are lower in the frontline setting um, than they are in the recurrent setting where patients have had multiple lines of, of cytotoxic chemotherapy. That's a really good point. Okay, well, thank you both for such a great overview and discussions. I feel that I am learning so much from my own practice and thinking about how to really think through what's best for each of these patients. And so I set up some cases here that I'd love to go through in terms of like using PARP inhibitor in the frontline setting. And kind of the way I think about it is this is sort of a very um, typical patient, a healthy female completed a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. She had did not have surgery first because of her bulk of disease. She did have have a, a good response initially and had an optimal surgery and then completed her additional chemotherapy for a total of six cycles of carboplatinum and taxol. She had a complete response based on her physical exam, CA125 and imaging. And this is kind of where we start. You know, you started this talk by thinking about, um, as you said, Dr. Moore, like level setting, like this was the beginning. Like we, we would normally just let this patient, you know, show up every three months and then still be really anxious about their, those high rates of recurrence. And now we have these opportunities to think about what we can do. And so we kind of categorize them and in, in different ways. And I often think of obviously the germline mutations, like does this, you know, I, I left the germline mutation ones out because I figured now we really know that if you're a BRCA1 mutation or a germline that's appropriate for this, we're going to be giving PARP inhibitors. But when we're thinking about not germline mutations, but we're thinking about the tumor testing, and then we're thinking about this um, HRD or HR proficient, or at least HRD negative, depending on how we want to use our terminology. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I think we already kind of got to like what and what kind of testing will help us, but thinking about some of the options for monotherapy versus Olaparib versus Bev. And so I think that's an interesting, you know, dilemma that we think about as well in terms of like, are there ways that you think about these three individuals differently in terms of what you would offer them? And are there other factors, you know, um, that come into mind for either of you? I really feel like you consider them separately, Bev, Bevcizumab versus PARP. Um, we have not demonstrated in the frontline synergy, evidence of synergy to justify mandating that they be given together. So, and you make the decision for Bevcizumab usually quite early before you know yeah. your germline testing. And so you've decided that that either use it in everyone or you use it in your stage four or your suboptimal, you know, everyone has their own sort of algorithm that they use for Bevcizumab, but you've made that decision. And then you get your testing back. And if they're BRCA, if you're using it and they're BRCA, you have safety and efficacy data for use of both. Um, if they're same with their HRD, BRCA wild type. And if they're HRD test negative, um, I think that you have a lot of comfort in, in just continuing the bevacizumab, right. um, to be honest, and, and being on label. So um, for me, the hard part is those cases that are maybe unknown or HRD test negative and, and they're like melting away to the platinum. And so I know mm, they have some vulnerability and I really want to use both because I'm a more is more person. And so sometimes I sneak and try and get away with it, but you really can't, you know, on label. So, so I, at this point, I, it's still two separate things for me, yeah. for me. I don't know what, um, what Barbara thinks. Yeah, no, I agree with everything you said. Um, I am curious, uh, Katie, Anita, if either of you use the um, Kellum um, algorithm at all here, which kind of looks at like the rate in the drop of CA125 as kind of a predictor of whether they might do better on uh, bevacizumab or, yeah. or PARP. Well, you know, that data just came out for the Velia study as well, yeah. which we, of course, can't use, um, Velipera, which is unfortunate. We are not using it here yet, but not for like any... Uh, like we don't believe it reason. We all think it's really interesting. Um, I think for us, you know, we have a lot of clinical trials up and running. And so you know, we have offered our patients participation in trials. And so there, there's not, at least for some of our patients, the opportunity to pivot based on that because um, mm -hmm. we don't know how they're going to do on oragovimab, for example. So, so we haven't really widely used it yet, although I'm intrigued by it because I do think I do. It's been very. It's all been exploratory. All the work that um, Dr. Yu, it's Dr. Yu has done. He's done a ton of work, and it's all been at, out of these big data sets from prospective studies, and it's been very consistent. But exploratory, so yeah. but very consistent. You know, in the subset that has the right values, and you can do the work in. So, I think it's compelling, Barbara. To be honest, like if I were in practice and I had somebody that wasn't following and I hadn't started bevacizumab, you know, I might. Um, I wonder though how often that happens just in patients that you already have a sense that you're worried about on. Yeah. Uh, you know, like patients who are getting neoadjuvant and they're just not shrinking or the CO25 is just already being pokey. Like you already have a sense of, I feel like I already have a sense of who I'm yeah. worried about in the front line, but maybe, maybe this picks up some more that I should be worried about. One thing that I feel like I struggle with is in this group that we either label HR proficient or rather HRD negative, which I think is my new thing that I'm going to think you thinking about now um, for thinking about like risk benefit and, you know, the quality of life considerations for these patients. Obviously, you showed a lot of compelling data that those patients do have um benefit there, maybe not to the extreme levels and the really satis more satisfying, at least, you know, obviously we want even better um, as the patients who are germline or tumor mutated um, or HRD in other ways. What is your kind of sense of that or just kind of your, you know, your gestalt of like, how are you counseling those patients and how much does the fact of like, how do they tolerate chemo? How is their bone marrow on their regular chemo? You know, how do a lot of these other factors like weigh into your counseling for those patients or do they? For me, you're talking about kind of this case three population. Yeah. Like the case here. three population, um, unfortunately, germline negative tumor testing is negative. You use commercial assays and they don't show HRD. Um, and we're left with saying like, okay, these are drugs that are approved and, you know, should we be using them and how do we really get at the, at the risk benefit ratio for those patients? 
Yeah, I think it's really important to individualize the therapy at, at in this point because um, none of our treatments are without side effects or, or toxicity. Um, and so I think we have to be very clear with patients what we expect their benefit to be. And oftentimes, you know, I wish we could predict perfectly what outcome they're going to have or how they would respond. But in this, so far, at least in my practice, in this case three population, I have really not been recommending a PARP inhibitor in this setting. Uh, we've been doing sort of bevacizumab or, or a treatment break or a clinical trial um, in this setting. We're very similar. We have a trial open that's predominantly for, it's the orgavimab study that um, Angelus Alvarez support is leading that is for BRCA wild type in, in settings where you are not going to use a PARP, which for us is homologous recombination deficiency test negative. Mm -hmm. We think that's a really interesting agent and study and, and actually may benefit patients. You know, I think we have to do better. If we have opportunities to study things and patients are interested in that, we have to do yeah. better than the current options. Yeah, no. Um, so, so we really, we need more studies here. Antibody drug conjugates may be coming here as well. And I'm interested in those. So trials are, are very much of interest here. And then it kind of depends if we started a, a bevacizumab or not, you know, we've, we've, that's already kind of been started. Although I will tell you, I have added it at the end with the last couple of cycles, just so I can make sure I get it approved for the maintenance to play that game. Um, so that I can get for patients where I feel like they need. But again, we know who those patients are. Like they're just the yeah. ones that just didn't respond. And yeah. The, yeah. the interval was just fibrotic and they have poor chemo response scores. The tumors do, not the patient. Patients doing the best they can. It's the tumor working against them. Like those sorts of situations maybe aren't fixable, honestly, but those are places where I'm adding bevacizumab. And you're right, I'm not gonna, it, PARP's not gonna help there. It's mm -hmm. just not going to help there by itself because yeah. you, mm -hmm. the tumors already told you it does not care about the right. platinum. It doesn't care about the platinum. It's not going to really care about the PARP either. So I try to come at it with, with, with bevacizumab, but the reverse is true. Like I said, if you know, you have these folks and you get this testing back and it's almost like a sadness now when their HRD tests negative, like I get, I get sad about it now that I know. And I right. like, it's like, I'm expecting them to do terrible. And then the tumor melts away and they feel good. And I'm like, well, let's try a PARP inhibitor because that's what I have. That's a really good point. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. So it's, you know, ironically, sometimes our our field or many fields are thinking about like, let's add more when we think the person's not doing well, right? Like let's add more to the cart. But this may be a interesting way to think about the HRD proficient, yeah. whichever way we want to call it, thinking about if they respond well, like, is that an opportunity that that reveals something about their tumor characteristics that may, you know, that may, so that, that adds another twist to my thinking process now, because I do agree that I think I've not been as strong of my reasoning about that in terms of not being able to kind of say like your benefit may not be as high as other, other patients. So I think that's a really interesting point. I'm going to move on a little bit to talk a little bit about kind of just some issues related to sort of the um, clinical um, issues in the recurrent platinum sensitive setting. And I think a lot of these have been touched upon, so I don't want to belabor them, but um, the idea of like thinking about what you guys may do in practice in terms of like, you know, we talked a little bit about the prior BEV, prior PARPs inhibitors, but what about like the number of cycles of platinum before you really transition a patient to PARP inhibitor? Um, you know, is there any clinical guidance or any other things that we can use? Um, how do you sort of think about your bone marrow response to your cytotoxic chemotherapy in terms of like thinking about your PARP inhibitor use or dosing perhaps, and thinking about, um, you know, whether or not any of this newer data changes. And we talked a little bit about how that can push things towards, you know, earlier lines perhaps, but but um, I'd love to hear some of these practical considerations that you may be thinking about, maybe even for either of these cases, they all sort of morph into one when we're in some ways thinking about the platinum sensitivity driving the PARP use. Um, so I'm not sure if their um, mutational status is as relevant as discussed. I don't know. I, I'm interested to see because Barbara and her team have done a lot of the translational work looking at mechanisms of resistance and reversions. So I actually call her team when I have questions, but I wonder about this, to be honest, because a lot of the trials in the platinum sensitive setting just said you had a minimum of four <laughs> cycles of chemo. And then patients were, you know, they had the option of, of enrolling on the study at that point, maybe with a partial response um, to the, to the platinum. Um, and that's how the studies were done. 
And, and so, and that's just what, what was done. But I think about whether or not if we start a PARP in the setting of a partial response when we could have gotten it better, maybe to a complete clinical response, which we all know there's still disease there, but anyway, less tumor, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. maybe stuff I can't see, does that make them less likely to develop earlier reversions or other mechanisms of resistance that I've maybe I've set them up for an earlier resistance than just sort of trying to get a real complete clinical remission with the PARP Right, like pushing it more to do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, I have a patient coming in this afternoon who's been just beat up on carbodoxal and five right. cycles, and she wants to stop. And I hopefully she'll go on a PARP. And I'm like, I don't care if she goes, you know, stops at five. I don't have any problem with that because she's NED. But um, but sometimes I you have those know. patients after two or three cycles, they're responding, but they're really exhausted, or they're really, yeah. you know, you're fighting their bone marrow, and it, it, and you're and you do wonder about where where to put those patients. Where do you put the line? And I, I mean, I think no, no. I was interested what Barbara thought of that. I was just gonna say, I think the only kind of data we have to to help us with that is maybe you know like solo three or the you know trials that went kind of straight to PARP instead of chemo, although yeah. the comparator in that trial was non-platinum chemo. So yeah. I don't know that we can necessarily know that here, but um, I do think that the, if someone's responding to, to platinum, you know, I would want to maximize that mm-hmm. um, and then move to part, but we, we don't know the, the right answer there. But again, individualized. As yes, well. no, I agree. <laughs> Moving on to a little bit about managing PARP toxicities. I think you know, each of the um, drugs have, you know, like pretty, you know, standard guidelines for dosing and different things like that. And, and where we're going to be doing um, sort of, uh, you know, dose reductions versus dose interruptions. And um, I think, you know, this is just sort of a, just a brief example, thinking about a patient who was on a PARP inhibitor sort of as an upfront um, frontline therapy. And within the first two months sort of had some grade one to grade two toxicities required a few either interruptions. And the idea of like, you know, when you're starting to see even after month one, some thrombocytopenia, some, you know, and obviously we know that a lot of these side effect toxicities have kind of the idea that they're going to happen early. And then people are going to be able to potentially, you know, potentially be able to be managed through them. What are your approaches in terms of kind of making these decisions about dose reductions and um, thinking about interruptions as well? Well, I think with, um, you know, weight-based dosing, platelet-based dosing, like how they did on their initial platinum chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we all kind of use that as a, um, as an indicator of how much Mm -hmm. toxicity they might have from the PERP inhibitor And, um, I mean, there's always patients that, you know, are a bit more on the fragile side. And I tend to start with lower doses in those patients. And then of course the kind of established weight and platelet based dosing for dosing for niraparib, if that's the drug I'm going to use. I think we've gotten pretty good at managing these, these toxicities, just pay attention, being careful. And then do you ever feel like this depends on your providers or your perceived benefit based on all this trial data that we've had? Like if you have the patients who you sort of put them on it and they're, you know, HR proficient versus the bracket, you know, how, how do we push harder for some patients or do we sort of, are we consistent across, you know, some of these? And I, I think it is very individualized because obviously a frail, more elderly patient, you may think about backing down sooner versus somebody um, who may want to be a little bit more aggressive about their care. So I think it kind of brings up some of these issues, but I do agree that the hematologic toxicity, we're a little bit more familiar with that and kind of has some nice, you know, guidelines from the, from the different um, drug companies as well. And I think that the heme, the heme management is like the same for everybody, but it's yeah. the, the side effects, you know, like if they're having fatigue or yeah, this is why I put this here. Or those exactly. Things. So like, thinking about these other yeah. ones that are not, I don't want to say as bad because they are, can be as bad for quality of life issues, but they're sort of, I've had to think of them as like potentially more subjective, like maybe patients dismiss it or providers dismiss these. Um, and you know, what are, what are you guys doing to kind of measure these? Maybe I would be interested to know if there's like, you know, off of a trial, are there, you know, more standardized pros that are, people are using or surveys or, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on those? Yeah. I mean, we try to just always, you know, pre-counsel about it. So people are not surprised. 
to ask them every time how they're feeling. And, and I think like any of our therapies, the greater the expected benefit, the more tolerance we have for mm-hmm. side effects, you know, right. looking at the BRCA germline mutation population, you know, I will beg them to get through their, their two years and, and really work as hard as we possibly can to make the side effects tolerable. And I don't think we have data that dose reductions and for these bothersome side effects really inhibit the efficacy. And I'm curious to see what, what Dr. Moore thinks of that too. I think it's just, as you said, it's setting expectations mm-hmm. um, and making sure that, that our patients understand sort of what the expect, what, what we anticipate, like the first eight weeks of PARP inhibitor cannot be fun. Um, you know, they don't feel good. It's like immediate three days, within three days, if they're going to have nausea, they have nausea, the fatigue kind of peaks at week six, and then starts to kind of accommodate to whatever it's going to be. And so, you know, I tell patients they're not going to feel good for the first two cycles, and then it will get better. And we just have to get them through it. And if they don't have that, they're like, oh, you lied. And that's fine. Yeah. But if you don't tell that coming off chemo and you're like, we're going to try this oral thing. Right. And then they feel really not very good. Um, you know, they're, they may not ma- maintain dosing, which can be life prolonging for, for some of our patients. So, so I really agree with setting expectations. Um, I'm super, super spoiled where I am, um, in that I have a clinical pharmacist who is mm-hmm. an expert at all these therapeutics, PARPs, ADCs, she actually lectures. So, you know, she's like the first call for a lot of my yeah. patients. And I know that most of our listeners do not have that luxury. And so I'm, I have to just always couch that I'm super spoiled where I am. But it really does come down to having like your nurses are your front line and right. Having good communication to make sure, you know, where the patients are. I mean, I do think that like, we, we, you know, we do have like a lot of patients who express a lot of fears on dose reduction where we, you know, whether it's their heme dose reduction reasons where we just really can't, you know, work around or these other um, toxicities. I do have a patient who, who do feel that resistance. So it's nice to think about like, you know, being able to reassure them in terms of what we can do. I agree. I mean, I think this is sort of like, you know, the crux of where a lot of our work and when we're we're working the best we can is the sort of these team of approaches. Like when we have PARP inhibitors, it's such a longer term treatment profile. So obviously we talked about kind of thinking about it in that two-year terminology and not necessarily beyond, but thinking about where your teams kind of come in for your workflow, for your genetic testing and your tumor testing, and especially for your toxicity monitoring. I think you hit hit on the role of the chemopharmacist. Um, I think we've, you know, tried to do different ways of being able to have enough you know, enough touch points with patients and whether that's with telehealth or whether that's with, you know, other types of ways. I don't know if anyone's getting more creative in terms of like using like any type of like electronic patient diaries or pros like that. I put rows and charts, but we can change that, but the pros Mm -hmm. and and different ways. So we are not, although we have a big M health core, mobile health core here where we could. uh, And I think it'd be a great way to follow. It is, um, that sound, it's, it is a good idea. The challenge for your site is, okay, the patient's it's five o'clock on Wednesday and she's reporting grade two fatigue. Who answers the phone? Like, and right. where does that go? So the responsiveness to these things that come in in real time um, have challenged the implementation of really some point. of these. Whereas the data you would get in the real time able to interact and keep your patient feeling good is huge. But the but the downside realistic, of having like, enough staff yeah, that, realistic. No, it's a really good point. No, for sure. That's hard to implement, um, um, especially at sites that are, you know, don't have a cancer center surrounding with all this staff, which is mm-hmm. most places where they take care of women with ovary cancer. So uh, mm-hmm. I think it's a great idea. It just needs some operationalization. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with that. And I do, I do want to just say that, um, you know, managing patients on PARP inhibitor maintenance. Like we had some initial struggles with just people kind of falling off the radar for labs and other things, because often there's a specialty pharmacy that's taken over the the prescribing. And we've had um, a few patients kind of get lost um, while they're on their therapy. And that's even at a, you know, at a 
tertiary academic center. And so no, I agree. we had to develop specific protocols with our pharmacy team and our nursing team to make sure that we're adequately monitoring patients. Each place has to kind of come up with what their workflows are for this. And I think the PARP inhibitors, because of the length of treatment that all of these patients are on, definitely stretches us for sure. So thank you to all of our um, lecturers and for sharing your expertise and your practical clinical knowledge on what you've been doing, because I think this has been incredibly helpful to kind of think through this um, this sort of maze of, of information that we get sometimes. And so I want to thank you for this really excellent discussion and thank the audience for watching. And we really do hope that this will be useful for you in your clinical practice. Please do remember to take the post-test and evaluation in order to receive CE credit. 